Now let's talk about the phases or states of matter. We're going to talk about uh, solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, those are the three states we're going to talk about now. Uh, our picture of a solid is that the particles have a rigid, definite shape and three-dimensional order. If we were to imagine at a very low temperature, uh, neon solid, we chose neon because it's an atom, and we'll draw each atom as a circle. We might imagine that those atoms have a three-dimensional order, uh, so I can only show two dimensions here uh, on this paper, but that'll be fine. That's a good schematic representation of it. And they are close to touching, um, you know, whatever touching means, and we'll talk about that. And uh, one of the things that's really important to understand is that uh, even though these are locked in three-dimensional order, that they have a rigid, rigid, definite shape that goes on in each of these directions, that if you're above zero Kelvin, which we are, since zero Kelvin is the lowest temperature, then all materials have kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy of a solid is, is reflected in each atom's vibrations. So kinetic energy of a solid is in its vibrations. And these are little vibrations lines. And we could draw vibration lines for all of them, but we'll just do some representative ones here. So the kinetic energy of a solid is reflected or is apparent in its uh, is uh, apparent in each atom's vibrations. Okay, and so they're vibrating in place. They have kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. We'll talk about potential energy but uh, in the future, but we'll talk about just kinetic energy now. Okay, and that's our picture of a solid. It gets a little more complicated if you have something like sodium chloride, or which is an ionic compound, and we'll talk about that later. It also gets a little more complicated when you talk about molecules, not atoms, but it's the same basic idea. Now let's talk about liquids. And liquids, the spacing of the atoms is approximately the same. And I'm using approximately, approx as the abbreviation for approximately. Uh, spacing of atoms is approximately the same as the solid, as for the solid. But the atoms have random positions. And movement. And so because of this movement, we will draw them at the bottom of some sort of container. And we'll draw them approximately the same spacing apart. Uh, but there will be no order to the positions. And there is some flexibility in the spacing. So, but on average, They um, are in the bottom of this container. I could probably draw a few more. I don't know, something like that. So the key picture here is that they are approximately the same spacing as the solid with random order. They do have kinetic energy of vibration, but they also have kinetic energy of movement. And that movement might be, uh, uh, we might visualize that in the form of uh, these atoms moving around in between each other like that. So the kinetic energy is apparent in vibrations and movement. And movement.
And now on to the gas. Gases, well, first off, to draw a gas, gases fill the entire volume of the container. So we'll draw a container, and inside that, we'll draw, I, mean, I guess this is still, this is neon gas, what we're used to dealing with if we deal with neon. Oh, one, two, something like that. Maybe one more in here. So for gases, the spacing is, let's say, there are approximately 10 diameters between one particle and the next particle. Between, and my abbreviation for between is B slash W. 10 diameters between uh, gas particles. At least uh, if we're gonna draw it, that's uh, a good starting point. Then uh, the other thing is that these particles have very fast motion, and we'll say a lot more about that, but for now, they're moving very fast. They're bouncing off the walls, and what we'll see is that when they bounce off the walls, they are uh, creating pressure on the walls of the container. So let's see, I guess this one's flying down that way. This one's flying down that way. Random motion, so approximately 10 diameters between gas particles, moving very fast. And our picture is on the order of hundreds of meters per second. Although again, that varies uh, widely as well. And uh, with random positions. And so that's our picture. That's what I'm looking for when I ask on the homework for you to draw a picture of each of the phases. And uh, it's, it's important that you understand that liquids are sort of an in-between phase. And we'll see that as far as temperature goes. And that the liquid is like a solid in the spacing of the particles, but like a gas in the random positioning of the particles. Okay? And uh, I guess don't draw the liquid as having the spacing halfway between a gas and a solid. So that's one point. All right. Now, uh, how do you turn a solid into a liquid and then a gas? I think you know the answer to this, but let's go over it. So when you go from solid to liquid to gas, you increase the temperature. Right, and uh, when you increase the temperature, you also increase the kinetic energy. And kinetic energy, I, I think I forgot to define this. Ke is kinetic energy. Sorry about that, we'll define it now, just in case. Increase the Ke, the kinetic energy, and when you increase the kinetic energy, and this is something we'll talk about a lot this semester, uh, kinetic energy, is proportional to temperature. And let me amend that before I write this out in English. I'll put a bar over it, and that bar will mean the average kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. And I'll add to this statement one other thing that the temperature has to be in Kelvin, and we'll talk about temperature units. So, increase the temperature, increase the kinetic energy, increase the amount of motion from vibrations, and we might imagine that a solid has two particles, and they're vibrating in place, and they have some amount of kinetic energy, and then you increase the temperature, and then they have more until they're moving around. And then once they have more, and they're in the liquid phase now, you add more, to, you increase the temperature, you add more kinetic energy, and then they fly apart into the gas phase. So that's our picture of phase transitions, at least a, a simple one.
Um, and energy and the phase changes are very important in chemistry, as we'll see. Now, what stops all substances from being gases? Those are intermolecular attractions or intermolecular forces. And for intermolecular forces, we have an abbreviation IMF, capital IMF. Uh, intermolecular forces, their forces of attraction are forces of attraction. that hold molecules, atoms, molecules, uh, uh, particles that hold or that hold particles together. Okay. And we actually close out uh, the end of this course by talking about intermolecular forces. It is the goal for you to be able to understand intermolecular forces on an atomic property basis and molecular property basis is one of the overarching goals of this course. Um, and so what we will see when we get there is that stronger IMF hold the particles in the solid phase to higher temperatures. And then again, particles could be atoms, ions, molecules. Stronger IMF hold the particles in the solid phase to higher temperatures. And so, if something's solid at room temperature, it is more likely to have stronger intermolecular forces than something that is a gas phase at room temperature, or a liquid phase or a gas phase at room temperature. That's got a period, good. And so this competition between increasing temperature and intermolecular, for to increase kinetic energy in motion tends to tear things apart. Intermolecular forces tend to keep them together. And that is one of the overarching themes for this course is understanding these for all molecules, atoms and ions. Well, we're almost done with this portion, but let's go over a couple more slides. Uh, formulas for each element in its lowest energy state. Most elements have the atom as their lowest energy state. For example, if we look at sodium, um, it is an atom uh, and it is also a solid. Uh, and uh, there are, well, let's do this. Um, most atoms are like this. Uh, let's talk about oh, uh, lead also falls into this category. Uh, neon, also an atom, but it's a gas. And, but there are seven diet, uh, diatomic elements, and it is important to know them. These elements show up as diatomic elements in chemical reactions. And those are uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And uh, fluorine is our halogen. Go down the halogen row. Fluorine, bromine. Ooh. Bromine is a liquid. And iodine is a solid. There are uh, two uh, polyatomic elements. Those are going to be sulfur and phosphorus, uh, P4 and S8. And if these two ever come up, uh, we will uh, tell you about it. You don't have to remember those. You do have to remember the diatomics. And when you don't have to remember something, uh, but it is useful to know, I will put it in parentheses. Now, allotropes. Allotropes are uh, different forms of the same element. For example, uh, I think a popular one is oxygen. There are other versions of oxygen. 
There's also just the oxygen atom, uh, which is not very stable, uh, and ozone with the formula O3. Those are three allotropes of the element oxygen. The most stable of which is O2 gas. That's the one that you will write in chemical reactions, although you will see from time to time other versions of oxygen. Another example of uh, allotropes is going to be carbon. Carbon has a graphite form. It has a diamond form. And both of these are solids at room temperature. It turns out that of these two, graphite is the lower energy substance. Another version is C60, also a solid. That one is called Buckminster fullerene. and is a fascinating and new material, I guess, to think discovered in the 80s. Uh, still working uh, a lot of research on uh, uh, different versions. And in fact, uh, this allotrope and other similar allotropes for carbon. Formulas of ions. Well, we are going to have a, an ion quiz. Uh, ions will be part of your exams. Uh, you're going to need to memorize the ions from the nomenclature handout. The nomenclature handout is in the uh, syllabus section of your um, learning management system. There are trends in the charges of the monatomic ions, um, and these include on going from the halogens, <coughs> excuse me, which are group 17, I'm going to write our group number in here, to uh, in this. Um, to sulfur's group or oxygen's group, those form in the minus two ions, those are group 16. Group 15 has nitrogen and they have minus three charges. Um, for uh, charges that are two plus, two minus, three plus, three minus, uh, the convention is to list the number first when it's for an ion, although if you were to list it as plus two or plus three, that's fine for me. And finally, formulas of ionic solids. In an ionic solid, we don't refer to them as molecules. There are no molecules. Uh, the proper way of uh, referring to a formula like NaCl is as a formula unit. So uh, when I talk about uh, the different types of species, the different types of things that exist in chemistry, we'll talk about atoms, we'll talk about molecules, we'll talk about ions. And when we talk about ionic compounds, we will refer to the formula unit. And for example, if we were to draw sodium chloride uh, on the page, I might draw it like this, where chloride ion is bigger than sodium ion. This represents a three-dimensional structure called the unit cell. And in reality, when you take a grain of salt and toss it over your shoulder, it has a structure much more similar to this. This structure is cleavable along those lines, and so that's why you can cut grains of salt.